Good morning. If you open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to take another bite out of verses 5 through 9. I am especially eager to preach this sermon. I have been for some time, uh, at least a few months. I have been very excited to get to this passage. I love teaching from the Bible. I love preaching before you on a Sunday. And I want you to know that as I pray for you and pray through the text and study through uh, the text I'm going to preach on uh, week to week, I really ache for you to see things in the Bible that help you get a right picture of who God is and of what he has revealed about himself, that it may drive error out of your mind if it's there. And and I'm sure that all of us have error in our thinking about God somewhere in our lives. It's kind of like even on on the cleanest day of your house, you know, when you have company coming over, you you clean the whole house, you still know that there's a closet somewhere that could be gone through again, or the garage. (laughs) Amen. It's like that in our thinking. There are places, no matter how how clean up we get in in, in our thinking about God, there's always some areas that we need to go back through and use the word of God to just sweep out the dust and the wrong thinking that can accumulate either from the negative influences of our own sinful nature, the world around us, or even the enemy trying to plant seeds of deception and our understanding of who God is. But other times, there are some things that we just never quite considered and thought about. I've been aching to get to this passage. I wrote a statement down about this passage weeks ago that I've been, I've been working on and testing and checking. I'm looking forward to sharing with you today, and I hope that it will, it will lead to greater love for God and worship in your hearts for him. Let's, let's read through this passage, 5 through 9, and then I'll preach through it. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking, It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Lord, this is your word. You have preserved what we have in front of us for thousands of years for our benefit. Lord, that you would tell us something true about yourself, maybe some things that are true about us, So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to sweep out of our minds and out of our hearts any wrong thinking, and I believe that there are probably glorious gems of truth that might be buried under an inch or two of dust, wrong thinking somehow. Uh, Lord, we may not have even considered uh, these things, and I pray that you'd help us to, to stare at them to think about them. Lord, for those who, who have thought of these and, and have read this verse and have uh, inspected it carefully and the idea that it, that it brings forward, I pray that it would just be yet again another time to polish that gem of truth in their mind that they may, they may stare at it and, and look at it longingly yet again, Lord, as we consider what a wonderful God that you are. Father, for any non-believer who will ever hear this, I pray that what they would see is a trust in your word a submission to the words that you have preserved for us, that we put something higher than us, you, O oh God, and your word. And so, Lord, let us submit to it, learn from it, and love you more because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. You might remember if you were here last week that we looked through the verse previous to this where the author cites Psalm 8. I'll just read that quickly. 
I'm going to do 6 through 8, where he, he cites Psalm 8. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. The author then, at that point, then provides his own commentary on this passage by saying in the rest of that verse, now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Now, last week, I sought to show that both the psalm citation and the commentary given by the author here can be applied either to us, humanity, or to Jesus in different ways. I said that the statements here to include the cited verses from Psalm 8 were originally written about mankind. But Jesus, as the chief representative of mankind, ultimately fulfills and secures the statements made about us. And I sought to demonstrate that from the passage last week. What I didn't get to last week was verse 9, right here, where the author identifies now that he is using Psalm 8 to chiefly point to Jesus. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. And he identifies who's the him he's mostly pointing to, namely Jesus. Now, this is the first time in the book of Hebrews that the author uses the word Jesus. First time that Jesus' name is explicitly mentioned. Before here, he's talked of as the Son. He's referred back to as the Son of God, that he is He is divine, He is human, He is fully God, fully man. But here we see the name of that Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament, Jesus. This is where the author extends the interpretation of the verse and the citation in Psalm 8 to point mostly to Him as the supreme representative of humanity. In other words, the kind of made lower than the angels is true of us, but it is even greater for Jesus. The kind of crowned with glory and honor that is granted to us is even greater for Jesus. So look at that phrase. He says, for a little while was made lower than the angels. This speaks of Jesus' incarnation. When we say incarnation, we mean him becoming man. Divinity, God eternal, the Son of the Father, putting on humanity. We celebrate now in Christmas the birth of Jesus. We acknowledge the incarnation from the conception to his birth that him coming into the world, him clothing himself in humanity. I've said this many times before. If you've ever heard me talk about the incarnation of Jesus, I can almost not get that word out of my mouth without saying that I believe that this is the greatest miracle in the Bible, hands down. I don't think that anything comes even closer, anything close to the great reality that is God becoming Man, and that'll certainly make it into every Christmas sermon I ever preach, because I think that it is so true. Think think about it. Jesus is in control over all that is happening in the Old Testament. He parts the waters of the Red Sea. Jude actually even identifies it as Jesus himself who brings the Israelites out of Egypt, and he parts. What's going on there? God is commanding water to go one place when it was a different place. This happens every time it rains, okay? All the time we see this. People being raised from the dead. He does this all over the Bible in many different ways for his purposes. He brings one nation upon another in judgment. God is in control of all these things. And these miracles are amazing and should be awe-inspiring and should be authenticating of God and of his word. But I don't think anything comes close to the incarnation of Jesus. Even creation itself. Some might argue, well, isn't, isn't God speaking creation into existence a greater miracle than him becoming subordinate to creation in some sense? I actually think that the greater you see the miracle of creation, the harder it is to believe that that creator would subordinate himself to parts of that creation. 
however big that was, that he spoke it into existence, how much bigger that he entered into it and made himself a little lower than the angels. To be clear, Jesus in his divinity was never lower than the angels. But in the incarnation, when Jesus puts on humanity, he adds to one nature, divine nature of the Son, a new nature that is man. This is why we say that Jesus is fully God and fully man. In his divinity, he was never lower than the angels, but for a little while, he was made lower than the angels. We saw this back in chapter 1. In verse 4, where it says that Jesus, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited, is more excellent than theirs. There was a period of time, a little while, a definite period of history in which Jesus' divine nature, his divine glory, his majesty was veiled among his creatures as he walked in his humanity. And while God is timeless, Jesus steps into history with us. You remember, that, that's what made the transfiguration of Jesus so significant. There was this amazing moment where Jesus takes his closest disciples up onto a mountain near Galilee. And, and he, he shows them that he actually is divine. And they got a glimpse of his glory as God. Psalm 8 says, just as we see again here, that namely Jesus is crowned with glory and honor. So the next part, he's crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So Jesus received a kind of glory here because of his death and resurrection. Last week, I argued this crowned with glory and honor language is true of all humanity. That's what David was writing in Psalm 8. The kind of crowned with glory and honor was that we are image bearers of God in dominion over the earth. It's that kind of glory and honor. You and I are made higher than the animals and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the the fish of the sea. It's almost exactly what it says in Psalm 8. We have dominion over the earth. Additionally, also in the future, we will receive a kind of glory at the resurrection. Look at Romans 2, 9 through 10. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. So who is this glory and honor and peace for? For everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. But here in our Hebrews passage, chapter 2, the author is going to tell us that Jesus gets a kind of glory that you and I will never, ever get. Why did Jesus get this kind of glory and honor? Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So Jesus received a kind of glory and honor because of his death and resurrection that he would not receive apart from his death and resurrection. I'm going to say that again. Jesus received a kind of glory and honor as a result of his death and resurrection that he would not have received if it were not for his death and resurrection. Now, I waffled over that statement for maybe six weeks. I had that exact one written out, and several times a week I'd come back and I'd look at the wording, and I'd change wording on it over and over to make sure that my statement was aligning with with what Scripture was teaching here. So I want to make a few statements. I want to make five statements about this glory of Jesus. Five statements, and then explain why this is such good news for us. These statements are meant to clarify what I mean when I say that Jesus receives a kind of glory and honor as a result of his death and resurrection that he would not have received apart from his death and resurrection. First, I'll say this. When we say glory, that word is used more than 150 times in the New Testament, some, some form of that. And it's used in many different ways. We have to acknowledge this. It can mean brightness. 
Like the first Corinthians, Paul says that there's different kinds of glory. There's a glory of the sun and a kind of glory of the stars and a kind of glory of the moon. And he's meaning brightness, like majesty of them, right? That's what he's trying to get at in his argument he's making there in 1 Corinthians 15. But glory can mean splendor, praise, honor, greatness. So here here are five statements. I'm going to say four, explain something, and then I'm going to land with the fifth statement. First statement. Jesus had glory before the world existed. Jesus says in John 17, 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus was not gloryless, and yet at a point gets glory. You and I actually could be said true of Before we existed, we did not have glory. And we were born. We were born as image bearers of God. There's a kind of glory there, and then a kind of glory we'll receive in the end. But Jesus had glory before the world existed. Here's a second glory statement. Jesus has glory that no man can ever receive. John 1.14. And the Word became flesh... And dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. What what kind of glory, John? Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. There's a kind of glory that Jesus has that no man can ever receive. What kind, according to John 1.14? The kind of glory that's given to the only Son of God. That's first. John 17.24, back to the... High priestly prayer, Jesus prays again. John 17, 24, so Jesus is praying, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. Why? Because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Because Jesus is the only son from the Father, because Jesus is the only one who existed with the Father prior to creation, in the Trinity, he has a kind of glory that you and I can never, ever have. It's divine glory because he is God kind of glory. You and I will never receive that kind. It can be said that a man can have glory. All over the Bible we see a man can have a kind of glory. We'll see even more places today. But this kind of glory is only for God. And it would be blasphemy for us to ascribe this kind of glory to anyone other than God. So the first statement, Jesus had glory before the world existed. The second statement, Jesus has glory that no other man can ever receive. And third, we cannot add anything to God's glory, nor can we take anything away. We cannot add anything to God's glory, nor can we take anything away. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11 is a, is a famous judgment passage. I want you to hone in on the, the part I bolded here. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, Israel, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. God will not spend his glory, that it will go from him so as not to return. You and I do not add to God's glory nor take away God's glory. And I'm going to quickly go to the next one to get to what might be in your minds. We cannot add anything to God's glory, nor can we take anything away. And yet, fourth statement, We are commanded to give God glory. Often it's said that we are commanded to glorify God. That is to give him glory. I'll show you one one quick place. You can find these all over the Bible. 
Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So here's why I moved quickly through those last two, because I want to get to the question, how does this work? How is it that we are to give glory to God if we cannot add to the glory that he has, nor take it away? Does the value of God, the intrinsic worth of God, decrease when people do not give him glory? Or to say it on the other side, does God become more glory worthy when we give him more praise, worship, honor, and glory? By no means. Giving glory to God means to acknowledge what is already true of him. One quick place, I'll show you where this says this in the the Old Testament. This is almost citing perfectly a psalm as well. First Chronicles 16, 28 through 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Ascribe what is already true of God. Glory. Remember when Jesus entered Jerusalem? You might remember this, the story of when he's on his way in and people are crying out, Hosanna, son of David. And the Pharisees rebuke them and say, do you hear them? They're worshiping you. Jesus, you mere man, do you hear them? Stop them from worshiping you. What does Jesus say? If they don't worship me, no one will. Jesus says, if they stop, the stones will cry out. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of worship. He is worthy of all ascribing of glory. I want to unpack what what I mean to convey here because I think it will be critical for us as we try to understand what is about to be said in this passage. That's why I'm doing this now. The because language has to be dealt with. This passage is about to say something about glory due to Jesus. So before we take that in, it's critical that we get this right. So here's my reasoning. If you're thinking like, man, this is kind of like highfalutin talk about glory and the the language here is just kind kind of weird and maybe... I don't know if I should tune into this. Listen, thinking wrongly about God's glory could mess you up in the way that you think about things as fundamental as creation, mankind, heaven, hell. There are lots of errors in thinking about the glory of God. I I was uh, talking with some Christian friends uh, last couple weeks. I was wearing a t-shirt that had the five solas written on it. My wife had gotten me for Father's Day a couple years back. And... uh, One of the five solas of the Reformation, the only statements of the Reformation that were so critical, stakes in the ground to try to articulate what was meant by all these Protestant reformers who were saying, we're saying this, which is different than that. One of those five statements was soli dei gloria, to the glory of God alone. This is something that people have struggled with throughout history. But when Christians have peered at the Bible and let it speak first and foremost and authoritatively, not through the grid of any human structure or institution or individual, it has become evident that God does all things for his glory. He is the ultimate and only final recipient of all glory. We cannot add to nor take away from the glory of God. And if we think wrongly about this, we're going to think all kinds of errors Some people think that God made us because he lacked something. That God's glory was at X. He wanted it to be at X plus a million. And so he made mankind, he made creation so he could grow and progress in his glory. That he could get something and attain something more than what he already had. People have said that and that is not true. Some people feel as though God spends glory units like currency and he wants to get back. And then as he spends glory units in creation and sin takes place and people do not give him the glory he is due, that he will end up with a net loss. Some people have actively set themselves to rob glory from God. Are they successful? Some people think, I think lots of Christians think this, that if there were just more people in heaven at the end, 
then there will be more glory for God. Have you ever thought this? This is at the root of a lot of wrong thinking. That at the end, if you thought like, man, it's going to be wonderful that there's going to be X number of people in heaven praising God for eternity, but it would have been better if it was X plus one. Do you think that? Is God settling for less than the most glorious possible eternity? When people go to hell, lots of error and things. When people go to hell, people think God gets less glory. God's losing glory when people go to hell. He's not getting glory from those people. It's not true. Thinking rightly about God and his glory will guard us from all of these kind of errors. You and I don't add anything to Jesus when we give him glory. We acknowledge what is already his. I want you to imagine for a moment a conquering king comes onto the battlefield and he overwhelms his enemy with such ferocity that there is absolute submission and surrender. And the reigning king from the opposing side comes before the conquering king and gets on his knees. You're picturing it. The one who's been conquered on his knees in front of the conqueror and the one on his knees says, I give you my life, my kingdom, my service as a gift. You think? Is that when the exchange takes place? In other words, if the conquered king on his knees refused to give the kingdom, to give himself, to give all that he has to the conquering king, would that work? No. The conquered king is acknowledging what is already true. You have defeated me. All that I have is yours. My life is in your hands. When he acknowledges his surrender, he's saying what is already true. He is ascribing to that king something that has already taken place. Christians, when you give your life to God, we use that language sometime when talking about conversion. It's a beautiful image, right? Give our lives to God. We are acknowledging what is already his. You always were under his authority. You always belonged to him in that he had authority over you. But now we say, I am yours. We have on the the wall out there, you see when you walk in, our mission statement. We exist to glorify God, strengthen believers, and reach the lost. Glorify God's the big one, right? I don't care to be part of any strengthening of believers if it's not glorifying God, or of reaching the lost. If that kind of reaching the lost is not glorifying to God, that's the grid through which we run everything. Will this ultimately glorify God? We want to ascribe to him the glory that he is due, but we need to get it right. He will get his glory. Glory for God is not currency, as some might think. It can't be spent, it can't be lost, it can't be traded, it can't be supplied or multiplied. If your image of heaven is a reality in which God could perhaps have gotten more glory, then it's not a right picture. God does not lose glory from the beginning to the end. To glorify God does not mean that we add to it. Look what it says in Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and Through him and to him are, what? All things. To him be glory forever. Where does all glory come from? From him. Through whom does all glory come? Him. 
To whom does all glory flow? Him. Isaiah 2, 12 and 17. Long passage, good passage. Look at 12 and 17. For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. 17. And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Even the judgment of God will be to his exaltation. Let me say the fifth statement as I try to continue what, what's being meant by this. Let me revisit. First statement, Jesus had glory before the world existed. Second, Jesus has glory no other man can ever receive. Third, we cannot add anything to God's glory, nor can we take anything away. Four, we are commanded to give glory to God, to glorify Him. And if there's still a piece that you're thinking, but I'm thinking of verses and there's a kind of receiving of glory, how does this work? Let's move on to number five. Fifth statement about glory. Jesus receives a certain kind of glory as a result of His death. Jesus receives a certain kind of glory as a result of his death and resurrection. Look at, look at what it says again in Hebrews 2.9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. Look at 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11, same kind of thing. There's a lot, lot of cool things to be said in here, but look at the point we're getting at. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. We'll see lots of verses like this throughout the New Testament. Philippians 2, I could have gone through that one as well with you. There's a kind of glory and praise given to Jesus distinctly because he died, because he suffered. <clears throat> now, in light of what we just said, we don't add anything to or take anything away from the glory of God. We don't add anything to or take anything away from the glory of Jesus. Ultimately, how does Jesus receive glory here? Well, in the same way that Jesus receives his inheritance of all things as a result of his coming to this world to die. If you were here with us several weeks ago, we talked about that a bit. This was the plan that was predetermined by the Godhead before the ages began. Jesus was always the heir and always the owner of all things. But according to the plan of the Trinity in eternity past, the Son was to receive his inheritance as a result of the cross. That's how it was planned. Both are true. That Jesus always retained control, power, authority of all things, and receives it as inheritance. Because God ordains the ends as well as the means. In the same way it was foreordained that Jesus would receive this special kind of glory as a result of his death and resurrection. I'm going to read for you Revelation chapter 5, a passage for you that I think might be helpful. This is a vision that the Apostle John has as he looks into heaven. And I think that this is well attested as the, the final moments. This is a kind of a fast forward into what the end is like as we see being talked about in his, in his vision, what he experiences, what he sees. Listen to what it is that John sees. I'm going to read, I'm going to read verses 1 through, I'll stop at verse 10 out loud for you. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, he sees God seated on a throne in this vision, in his right hand, a scroll written, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. 
And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? You picturing it rightly? There's a, there's a scroll. You've never seen that? The wax kind of seal. You put a, a bunch of wax at the point at which it's folded over or rolled over, and then, and then a signet ring would be pressed in. So that, that seal would have to be broken. It kind of is the, the equivalent of our modern day, a sealed envelope. But this had seven seals that had to be broken in order for it to be opened. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? John is looking into heaven. And no one in heaven or earth or under the earth, heaven or earth, that's angels and all the celestial glories and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's earth, mankind and beasts and under the earth. That's a term literally meaning like those who are dead, even maybe demons. There is all the creatures that exist who is worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And John says, and I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. You might remember in Genesis chapter 2 when, uh, when God creates man and he doesn't have woman yet at his side. He, he marches all the beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the seas in front of Adam. He names all of them and no suitable helper was found. It's kind of like that again at the end of the book of Revelation. He looks at all the creatures and none, none is worthy to open the scroll. And he weeps. Somehow John knows there's something profound about this. And one of the elders, his elders seated around this throne in his vision, he says earlier, and one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, he described earlier these angels, And among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. What is a lamb standing as though though it had been slain? What's a slain lamb look like? Its throat is slit? Probably blood? With seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went... And took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp, and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy, look at this yourself. They sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. What made Jesus worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals? Because he died. That's what made him worthy in a way that no other creature in all of creation could be worthy. That in perfect purity, not deserving death, he was slain. They continue on a couple of verses later in verse 12, the same passage, saying with a loud voice, they're continuing singing now, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory. There's that phrase again. And blessing. There is a glory-giving song in heaven that we can sing about Jesus. We would not have been able to sing if he was not the lamb who was slain. Here's why I want you to glare at this with me. Do you see how wonderful this is? That God's glory is secure? I want you to imagine for a moment, have you ever seen a movie star? Or a, or a musical artist where they stand up to receive an award at one of those fancy galas, right? And they go up on the stage and they got tears in their eyes and they, they grab hold of the, the award and they say, I just want to thank all the people who got me there. And they oftentimes will say, and I want to thank all of my fans 
without whom I would not be here. That is especially suitable for a person to say in that moment, isn't it? Because without the fans, they would not be there. If none of you saw that person's movie, they would not be getting the award. If none of you bought that star's album, they would be a nobody in the musical scene. Your praise, your honor and glory given is necessary for them to be worthy of receiving an award. This is not true of our God. The kind of praise, glory, and honor we would give to God is more like the kind of praise given to an Olympic gold medalist. I don't care if you cheer or not, I will run faster than the people next to me. They get the gold regardless. You and I are going to fail 1,000 times in our lives. This is why this is so beautiful. Let me bring it very practical, let land here with you. You and I are going to fail a thousand times in our lives. What do you do as a Christian when you do that? How do you think? Some failures are going to be way worse than others. And you know what I mean. Tens of thousands of your failures are not even going to come to the light of your your eyes. You're not going to think about them. You're not going to even realize it. Sometimes other people come to you and say, I think you're wrong in this area. What? What? Lots of times this happens. All of us err and don't even realize our failures, our fallings, our sinfulness. And other times, we'll stumble so hard, we'll take a whole group down with us and we'll hit our face in the concrete and bleed all over and think, there's no way I can get back up again. You know this. As a believer, when you fall, when you sin, did you rob God of glory? Quote this with me. You know know this verse. You should know this verse, I think. If you're memorizing any, this is on the list. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In order to be Christian, we say we have fallen short of the glory of God. You can't be a Christian if you think that you are deserving of the glory of God. Your failures... Your sins, your falling flat on your face, and your little stumble in the race, they do not bring God down. They don't lower the team average. Your sin and mine, think about this, they are used by God for something amazing. Your sin and wickedness. Back when you were an enemy of God, before you were saved, and even today, every attempt to undermine the glory of God that exists, either yours or anyone else's, is seized from us and maneuvered by God to bring glory to Himself. Nothing can stop God from receiving. Glory. God will get glory through every circumstance that happens. Either in judgment or in mercy. One of the reasons I think that when people fall, they have a hard time getting back up and moving forward is they're afraid they're going to drag the team down. They're afraid. I've I've stolen something. I've robbed something from God. Now, pause. I'm not for one moment saying that sin is not awful and terrible and should be repented of and has consequences and hurts and stings and is hated by God. Yes, all of those things. But I know it's so so common for when believers to sin. I'm going to separate from the body. I'm I'm going to shift to a different phase of of living with others at this time because if if I don't, I'm going to I'm going to bring my filth into the church and around the people and somehow this is going to be damaging to God. A right view of our sin hates our sin. But we know that we don't affect the outcome eternally. God will receive glory for everything that happens. 
the most terrible event, the most unjust event that has ever happened in the history of the world, more wicked than any of your sin and my sin combined and multiplied, was Jesus being murdered on the cross. And God receives glory because of it. It's my hope that as we think about the glory of God and that we glorify him, it does take place that we do give God glory. We are to live rightly that the world will see and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. We are to live in such a way that all the things that we do give glory to him. But in the end, you must know God will get his glory. All is due to him. He will not lose one smidgen of it because of what you and I or anyone else does His glory is secure and have peace because of that. Let's pray. Father, when we think of these giant, beautiful things like your glory, we are incapable of seeing it rightly unless you give us your word. Lord, I thank you that you have shown us so many times and places and ways. God, you don't lose, you win. God, you don't don't get less You don't spend. You don't make a bad investment. Lord, I pray that we would see sin as it really is, that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we would come alongside each other and acknowledge it for what it is. And at the same time, we would sing to you and praise you for your glory. Lord, every wicked deed will be drawn into the light to give glory either to the Son for dying for that sin or to produce glory for God as wrath and punishment and justice are meted out for eternity in hell. Lord, help us to see rightly about these things. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.